please uh, to take their seats, please, so we can get this uh, session underway. Um, good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, <coughs> and welcome to this uh, session, which is the second we'll be having on our agenda within the theme of the of the conference. I'm very delighted uh, that um, we are taking the gender dimensions of uh, the, the question of political finance and quite seriously, uh, as we should. Um, and uh, what we'll be trying to do in this session is building on the initial exchanges which took place in the plenary session uh, yesterday uh, and probably taking some of the ideas uh, further um, hoping that at the end of our conversation, we'll be able to come up with some uh, further recommendations uh, for action, uh, which could be the basis both for uh, idea uh, and other actions uh, to uh, keep their work uh, in the uh, We do know that there are good practices around the world, uh, around on the question of uh, addressing the gaps uh, that exist uh, with regard to the financing of especially female candidates uh, in elections. Uh, the, the issue of financing, uh, at least from some of the experiences that have been documented, is clearly one of the areas which uh, comprise discouraging, sources of discouraging uh, for attracting effective female participation. And there are many other factors, but uh, uh, financing is clearly one of them. Uh, and as the cost of participating in politics escalates around the world, uh, so also the danger that uh, women as politicians uh, might find themselves uh, marginalized. Uh, some political parties and in some countries we've seen uh, efforts uh, that have been deployed to try to redress some of the uh, problems associated uh, with the financing gap suffered by uh, women. Uh, some of it as a legislative nature, some of it non-legislative, uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing uh, more about these examples uh, from the panelists. Uh, but we, uh, in, 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 in outlining them, I Para hope we'll also be able to share experiences on which those initiatives uh, have worked effectively as to the potential candidates uh, for representation elsewhere uh, around the world. Um, the panel will be attempting to address a number of questions. Um, I'll just very quickly run through them. Uh, the first of them will be to indicate the methods that have been effective in providing women with money for co contesting party primaries and what can be improved upon. The second will be um, uh, what practices have been effective with regard to using voluntary party political measures, including intra-party fundraising mechanisms, sometimes subsidies to women candidates, or the reduction of nomination fees for female candidates which can be quite uh, steep in some countries, sometimes even set to discourage participation as opposed to encourage participation, uh, as well as partisan fundraising networks targeted particularly uh, for the benefit of female candidates. And are there uh, mechanisms or is there room for us to register for the Uh, thirdly, what has been effective with regard to tying public funding to gender equality and what can be improved also in this domain. And finally, what kind of balance should we strive to achieve between legislative and non-legislative approaches uh, to help in terms of I have a very rich panel, um, and I think uh, you can expect uh, uh, some very exciting uh, contributions uh, from these panelists. Uh, panelists, uh, very experienced group of people. Um, the first of them who will be speaking is uh, Ellen Caldera. She is a member of, you're not coming first? Who's coming first? Oh, oh who? Sorry. My program says Ellen is first. Anyway. Okay. Uh, we are going to have uh, Julie uh, Valentin, who 
Good afternoon uh, to everyone in the room, um, and thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, I must say that um, we're very pleased with the cooperation that we enjoy with International Idea, um, and I think um, this conference really has, has made an effort to put um, the issue of gender equality in political finance um, front and foremost, so I, I really applaud those efforts um, of Idea and the partners uh, to this meeting. Um, my name is Judy Ballington. I'm policy advisor on political participation at UN Women, and in a former life, I uh, worked at International Idea um, in the political parties program too. Um, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today is where should I, excuse me, where should I aim the? Okay, if you could just click for me, maybe. Oh, I don't think this is working. Oh, on the side. Okay, the perils of going first. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by providing a brief overview of the normative framework that we're working on, on political participation and why it matters. Um, I would like to look at some of the key issues in financing uh, for women in politics. Um, includes things like systematic, systemic barriers as well as fundraising barriers in particular. Um, then I'll cover measures to level the playing field, which includes uh, non-legislated measures, which is what I will focus on, and then end with some recommendations. Okay. I don't know. If, did you click or was that? Ah, good. Back on track. Um, so the normative framework. Um, is derived from a number of sources, including political and human rights declarations, conventions, and revolutions. Um, there are three key ones, um, which I've put up there on the timeline. CEDAW is seen as the Women's Bill of Rights and the cornerstone of all UN women's programming. Um, the CEDAW convention makes the case for the use of temporary special measures to level the, the playing field, or at least to have um, de facto equality. Um, the second one um, is in 1995 uh, as the Beijing Platform for Action. Um, this is a follow-up, of course, to CEDAW, um, and it really became um, the blueprint for um, governments to, to move forward on their gender equality commitments. But what was important to Beijing was um, it stated that all, all countries should aim for gender balance in decision-making positions. Gender balance is, of course, interpreted differently in different countries, but it's largely understood to mean 50-50. Women should hold 50% of positions in uh, elected bodies. In 2011, there was also another UN General Assembly resolution, which is explicitly on women um, and political participation, um, and it reaffirms the, the need for all states to strive for gender balance in all elected bodies, and urges the review of electoral systems and make changes as appropriate so that women can contest on an equal basis with men in elections. Um, the, I was just going to say that the point about these conventions is important because they establish the principle of temporary special measures. Um, TSMs are largely known as quotas. Quotas have been adopted widely to promote women's political participation. But in this context, we're not talking about quotas to, to increase the number of women, but rather spe temporary special measures that states might take to help um, level the playing field in terms of political finance. So um, do we have a level playing field? The numbers were mentioned yesterday, and you're probably all quite familiar with it. Uh, today, 22% of parliamentarians are women. Um, we have 10 um, out of 152 women heads of state, um, which has increased slightly since three, uh, from three um, in 1995. Um, and we have 14 women, um, actually, actually that's 15, sorry, we recently had Greece appointed um, as heads of uh, government. Now, in terms of how money matters in these equations. Um, I think there's limited data available, and I think we found this across a number of the discussions that have taken place. 
um, is that when we're looking at campaign spending, we know that women anecdotally say it's an issue, but it's not really backed up by a lot of data. Um, but we know it's an issue, um, as one um, activist from Liberia noted, money is one of the essential elements that facilitates the election of women and increases their participation in politics. In Liberia, this is key, and, and one must have sufficient money to transport voters to rallies, feed them, print t-shirts, flyers, etc. The candidates also need to pay their campaign team and keep them motivated. Our whole electoral process has been commercialized, and the people with the cash carry the highest votes. Um, I think the substantial sums of money that are usually required to run a campaign and win constitute a common obstacle for many women. Um, in many countries, as we know, election is closely correlated with the amount of money that one can raise, um, and especially in terms of media exposure. Uh, lack of finances disproportionately affects women, since they typically have less access to money networks and credit. They also have less time and confidence to raise funds on their own behalf. Um, just to outline some of the obstacles that have been um, noted in different research, um, the limited research that is available out there. Um, socioeconomic barriers persist at all levels and in multiple forms for women. Um, there are gender gaps in women and men's economic status, which is reflected in employment levels, salaries, recruitment, and leadership in the private sector. This was illustrated, for example, yesterday with a few women who serve on boards or as directors of Fortune 500 companies. Um, the situation is compounded by women's lower socioeconomic uh, position in most states, with many women lacking basic resources or economic independence necessary to pursue political office. Political empowerment there go therefore goes hand in hand with economic empowerment. The next main obstacle facing women is that political finance are um, political finance, sorry, is the candidate selection process. Es el de oh. Sorry about this. Lost the slide. Oh, well. What I was going to say is that uh, candidates are key, um, and the candidate selection process is key. Uh, one of the issues is that social norms often view women as not as experienced or as a political liability. So when it comes to selecting candidates, political parties are often wanting to go with those that are not uh, viewed as risky. Um, in this situation, women often are... Um, you know, they're deprioritized in favor of men who may have more access to money networks or may bring more um, cash to the party for campaigning. So the, the other er um, issue I wanted to mention um, is electoral systems. Um, there is a, I've noted in, the, um, in, in several interviews with women that the electoral system matters, although we haven't got the la the, a real sort of data source to, to back it up. But the idea is that in the candidate-centered electoral systems, or first-past-the-post or single-member districts, that women have a greater burden of fundraising than in this proportional representation system. Um, we found in several countries that when women are eventually taken on by the political party and become a candidate in a PR system, there is often more um, campaigning that is done by the political party and women are expected to raise less funds. In candidate-centered systems, this is seen as one of the biggest obstacles to, um, to women's election. Um, there is the um, possibility of running two elections, a primary uh, election to win a nomination, um, and then followed by the, um, the actual campaign. Um, so the, the, the electoral system has a huge uh, impact. But again, like I said, it's, it's the data in this is really missing, um, but the evidence through interviews and through qualitative research shows that this is, to be, this is the case. Okay. Um, sorry, I realize this is actually not the, the PowerPoint, uh, the latest one, so let me just try and work with what we've got here. <laughs> um, so, Scarcity of uh, resources. Um, 
Some candidates have also pointed out that they have difficulty raising um, deposits to register as, as candidates. Um, they also have limitation in, in raising loans or access to credit because of their lower economic status. Um, distribution of public funds is another um, issue. Um, firstly, it's often restricted to those political parties that are in parliament already. So um, newcomers to the process, those that may want to actually pursue a gender equality agenda or women's political parties which are not really elected yet, will have, access, will have trouble accessing uh, public funding. Um, there, there is also an issue of unequal distribution of funding within the political parties. Is more going to men uh, than women? Uh, lack of data here, but the, the um, interviews we've done suggest that there is, uh, there is not an even distribution to women candidates. Um, the last issue is incumbency, um, and I think this is particularly evident in the US where it costs uh, huge, huge, huge sums of money to unsolicited um, uh, MPs. Um, so, if women are contesting um, in an, where there is an incumbent um, running, the chances of, of winning are really uh, quite slim. So, this, this adds another um, challenge for them. Three minutes? Yeah, okay. Can we skip a few then? So, um, what I want to say is there's two ways of tackling it. Um, the, the research we've been doing with International Idea um, points to two main ways to, to combat this. One is a legislative route, um, which Ellen is going to talk about. The other one is looking at the non-legislated um, non uh, measures. Um, the first one is um, in the non-legislated realm is working with political parties. They're really no the main actors in addressing the funding gap through A, um, implementing legislation that might already be in existence, and B, by taking voluntary measures. Some of the voluntary measures they might consider um, are setting up um, party funds which will raise and distribute finance to women candidates. So for example, in Canada, um, the Liberal Party has the Judy um, Lamarche Fund, um, which controls how the funds are spent and which candidates to support. Um, in Ireland, um, the Labour Party has identified five Cs, which are important for women's elections, care, culture, cash, confidence in candidate selection, um, and they provide training courses and organising fundraising events specifically for women candidates um, and prioritise first-time women candidates. Um, in Ghana, there are other um, in initiatives where uh, several poli political parties have agreed before the election that they would all allocate at least 10% of the funding they receive to women aspirants. Um, there are other ways that political parties can um, contribute, subsidies and in-kind contributions, like paying for childcare um, costs in the campaign period. This is done in Canada by the Liberal Party. By covering registration and membership fees, this is done in Ghana, for example, with there's a 50% re reduction for women seeking a nomination. Um, and also through partisan fundraising networks like Emily's List and Wish List in the US um, and Emily's List Australia, which has tried to replicate as well. Sorry, I, I won't have time to go into detail on those. Um, just to highlight a couple of more um, non-legislative measures. Um, in Nigeria, there's an interesting initiative of microfinance and trust funds. So, um, Kawan, uh, a women's organization, provides low or no interest loans to women candidates. Um, in the one election, 36 of the 48 aspirants that they supported were actually elected. So it was a huge boost to those women having the funds to be able to campaign. Um, just to say as well, um, as I know my time is up, um, that the work of international and regional organizations is also very important. Of course, international organizations cannot support women candidates directly, um, but there are indirect ways where they can um, support um, the training and capacity building efforts of, of running a, su a successful campaign, a campaign, but also how to tap into existing um, fundraising networks that may exist on the ground. Um, I think I'm out of time. I was going to end with some recommendations. Um, am I out of time? One minute. Okay. So, a couple of recommendations to legislators. Pass laws and policies that include um, different financing regulations for women and are enforceable where this is appropriate. Um, I think legislators can also review the existing legislation from a gender perspective and ascertain the effectiveness or the impact on women. Um, tie public funding to gender equality commitments. Ellen will cover this, but this is another way that um, legislation can help close the gap.
steps that Sir, uh, finance puede regulatory cubrir bodies esa brecha. could ensure that all También finance legislation is complied with and report sex desaggregated data where appropriate. I think this is key. Eh, the lack of data is, is what is really holding back moving forward. Es que We're not moving forward because of the lack no of data in this area. Um, no and I think the regulatory bodies can also provide the force on political parties' uh, compliance, um, which would help um, um, transparency in this area. Lastly, um, political parties can conduct internal reviews of their differential um, effects of fundraising practices on women and men within the party and develop a plan for ensuring that women actually have access to funding necessary to win a campaign. Um, they can also implement targeted fundraising mechanisms to channel funds to women candidates, reduce or waive nomination fees for women candidates, ensure equal allocation of funds to men and women. I think that's probably the, the, the most important thing that they could do. Um, and the other one is to invest in women through training and financing. So um, I'll end there. Uh, apologies for the wrong slides, but I hope, I hope the message came across. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, Gilly, uh, for your Muchas gracias por la presentación. Nos mostraste un poco de historia en la conferencia de Beijing y las nuevas iniciativas en el marco de la, del sistema de la ONU. Seguramente hay muchas experiencias que veremos en el público cuando vemos el equilibrio entre medidas legislativas y no legislativas. Eh, pero antes de empezar la discusión, ¿qué papel potencial las alas femeniles de los partidos y los caucus pueden jugar para llevar esto adelante, especialmente en áreas no legislativas. Para nosotros en África, y en que creemos que en otros países, especialmente en Estados Unidos, la primera dama es, tiene mucha influencia. ¿Cuál es? la posibilidad de que la primera dama en diferentes países sea una impulsora para que impulse eh, candidatas mujeres. Creo que la respuesta en los países a la primera dama es algo eh, mezclado, pero es interesante. Es una colega de IDEA Internacional, es editora del manual y también eh, dirige algunos comités para el instituto. Entonces, si por favor me pueden mostrar. I hope you will all be able to hear me because I have this extremely spicy sauce also at lunch, so I feel like I have a bit of a challenge speaking, really, but let's, uh, let's give it a try and see what happens. But anyway, now the PowerPoint is up there. So my presentation will focus on the formal political finance regulations pertaining to the African gap. We heard there are many other measures, but these will be on the, on the rules, on the regulations, basically. Um, so most political finance legislation is actually defined in a quite gender neutral way. So the aim is not to specifically you know, address no the gender inequality, eh rather to reduce the advantage of rich candidates or to increase transparency or similar, more in general. But even if these type of regulations don't have the aim to increase si uh, gender equality, no they may in practice have a gender impact. For example, if you limit the political advertisements, um, we all know that this is a very high cost si for many candidates. Um, I mean, that ha propaganda. has the effect that candidates have to resort to more low-cost campaign methods, and that can then be more advan uh, advantageous to women who lack uh, funding in the same way as men. Uh, if you have general uh, re uh, regulations on transparency, si well, that gives us a better insight in, into the party affairs. We can see that you know, there's less uh, murky deals with uh, no uh, illicit finance networks uh, and politicians. 
those type of deals often uh, are more beneficial to men, so transparency is, is helpful for, for women in that regard. Uh, of course, better transparency also means that we can have a better overview of where the money ends up inside the party, which candidates get, yes, and so on. I mean, having limits on campaign donations, um, we know that women earn less than men, so women give smaller donations, and they often also give to women candidates, so there you have the cycle that women candidates get, more, uh, get less uh, Funding. I mean, um, I mean, it might be difficult for a woman candidate also to convince her party then to, to nominate her above a man uh, and if she doesn't have the same cash to bring in. So in that respect, limits on campaign donations can be helpful. Uh, generally, having a provision of state funding that can also have an important role, of course, for women's access to the political process. There is some research indicating that women tend to take advantage more of uh, public funding programs, for example. Um, which then tells us that they appreciate that, that type of uh, programs. Publico, and of course, public funding diminishes the role of, of private funders. Si but actually what we'll be discussing more uh, later is how public funding can be dispersed privados. conditionally on parties actually bueno, investing in gender equality. And this is uh, just to show you an extract from IDEA's political finance database. We have questions about laws and regulations from 180 countries. And some of the questions are about gender uh, equality specifically, uh, tied to public funding. So here you can see that about 30 countries in the world since the 1990s have started to introduce uh, gender targeted legislation. And there are a couple of common approaches in doing so. Uh, the first one, yeah, the first uh, approach is basically to earmark funding for specific gender equality uh, activities within the party. So, for example, we heard yesterday from Kim Nieme about Finland that the, the parties must earmark a certain percentage for the women's wings work within the party. We have an example from Korea uh, that 10 percent of the public funding must be used for political development of women. The second approach is to reduce public funding for those parties that don't nominate candidates uh, often in accordance with quota laws or that fail to actually get those candidates elected. Um, in Ireland, parties lose 50% uh, of the funding if they can't uh, have more than 30% of, of uh, Kenya has a rule basically saying that parties with more than two-thirds of the national office there, or the internal party leaders, they are the same gender, they're not eligible to get public funding at all, uh, and I believe not even allowed to compete in the the third approach no of trying to public funding to gender equality is not that different from the second one, but this is more a carrot than a stick. So basically, parties get more money if they, if they nominate or elect women. So from Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, you can see that 10% uh, of the public funds are distributed to parties in proportion to the number of seats. So held by the less represented gender. So that's taking it a step further, so not only to nominate women, but also get them elected. So the question is, of course, what's the effect of all these type of regulations? I think I agree with Julie that the problem is that we don't have enough data to, to say this for sure. Uh, and I think that's also why we're all here today, to find out more and to learn more what has worked and what has not worked. Um, so from an empirical perspective, it's not so easy to draw conclusions about the, uh, the impact of these no type of regulatory reforms, but I'd really like to underscore it doesn't have only to do with the gender no area, it really applies to many other areas. In the other room, they're talking about public funding in general and the effects of that, and we know, we know quite a little about that. With that said, I mean, there are organizations Dicho like eso, Women and ISIS, uh, OSCE, and of course IDEA that have started to, to, uh, to do analysis. Uh, we have commenced in Kenya and Tunisia this year, and we'll continue with Colombia to do country studies Tunisia. together with NAND. <laughs> Well, uh, and what we did basically Colombia is to look at some of the factors, uh, some of the connecting factors between gender equality and, and money. Um, it's very small text, of course, on the PowerPoint, but basically what it says is that we looked at public funding and the, the connection to gender equality, and in theory, as I just mentioned, it's supposed to be very positive and it's helped women's participation. But in practice, in, in, in the Kenyan case, um, there wasn't really a clear connection because we saw that parties uh, just created offices or created positions without any function so that they can actually get the funds. 
sin funciones para recibir el financiamiento. Y eso nos dice que tenemos que supervisar esto para ver dónde termina el dinero. El partido asegura que este dinero why was it given to the parties in the first place? It also raises the question about if it's right or wrong to, to just give money to the parties in a lump sum to end up in the general party coffin uh, that they actually got because they were supposed to be more gender sensitive. Um, the reason why we chose Kenya from the start is basically because, because there have been fewer members in parliament in Kenya uh, than in the rest of the sub-Saharan parlaments. Um, at the same time, they have very few restrictions on spending and, and uh, income. Uh, and we all know that the money plays a big role in Kenyan politics because, I mean, their member parliaments are among the highest pay, paid in the world, basically. Um, I already mentioned monitoring where inside the party, uh, monitoring where inside the party the money ends up as one of the findings from this study. So all these findings I'm mentioning because I think they're applicable to other parts dinero. of the world as well. Um, the second point was the candidate nomination el process, and Julie touched upon this as well. Uh, many of the candidates Julia in Kenya stated that they often spend more money during the, the candidate uh, nomination process than in the general election. And this we have heard from other parts of the world as well. But yes, it's really, really rare that money raised and spent in the, uh, the nomination period is regulated by law. Campaign Casta Finance Act in Kenya, the new one from 2013, no is innovative in the sense that it has spending limits also for Kenya the candidate selection process. Um, I think Israel has also reporting requirements Israel for primary campaigns, Israel but maybe this is one lesson. Other countries may also want to be regulating this part of the electoral process a little bit further. Then the effects of spending limits. It was a bit too soon to evaluate this in the Kenya case because it only was uh, instigated in 2013. But what did come out is basically that women reported that they often have to outspend men. So they have to spend more money to become you know, seen as uh, uh, you know, good uh, politicians, basically, or to prove themselves. And just to mention that we have to be aware also that political finance provision can be counteractive to gender equality. So in this case, if you cap the spending limitations, actually the women needed to spend more to, be, to prove their worth. That's not to say that I don't agree with spending limits, but it has to be put together with other measures. Um, I'm actually going to leave you with a few questions, because we're here as a community to try to tackle this uh, better. Um, the first question is, which areas of research do we need to further invest in? And, for example, NDI Ukraine and CND Kenya research uh, quite recently told us that, contrary to popular belief, feeling women candidates doesn't make a party less popular. You can actually get them more votes. So I'm just putting one idea out there that we can perhaps invest in more research-based awareness raising among parties to convince them about the need to field candidates in addition to you know, uh, giving them the right amounts of funding and so on. The second one is, of course, how can we find evidence of effectiveness of these legal instruments? And I think we need to do more in-depth studies, especially of the cases that have been around for, for a while, and this is why I'm really keen to hear from Barbara and Frank, because that's one of the oldest cases in, 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 the, in the group. And the final question, how can we here pool our forces? Perhaps we need to create a community of practice, so we divide areas of research between us. So we get together now and then, we discuss our findings, our results. Basically, what Julie also mentioned, to take this a step further, because I think we're all doing small efforts on our own behalf, but we need to combine them. So please consider these questions, and I hope to hear from you with the right answers. Thank you. Escuchar de ustedes las respuestas correctas. I'm just going to show the Kenya Solo paper too. So if you're interested, this is the study from Kenya. Este es el estudio de Kenia y les po podemos conseguir copias. Okay, si thank quieren. you very much, uh, Ellen. Muchas gracias, uh, Ellen. I think those questions are useful. Creo que esas preguntas uh, son I'm muy útiles. En particular, porque en la how, experiencia uh, parties more or less subvert Dijiste que los partidos pueden hacer cosas que no era en el sentido de las leyes como para evitar el dinero 
no se usa para lo que estaba destinado. Es como algo eh, formal, oficial, no más sin tener el contenido. Y podríamos también prestar más atención a la promoción de gasto dirigido. El ciclo electoral puede ser muy largo. ¿En qué momento es más importante el financiamiento para mujeres? Deberíamos entonces alentar gastos dirigidos en cierto momento del ciclo para que haya más efecto para las candidatas. Es algo para considerar y también para platicar. Mientras tanto, seguimos con Bárbara. Bárbara viene de Francia. Es un experto en estos temas. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Julie y Helen muy bien dieron el contexto dando cifras para el debate y la discusión. Como enfaticé ayer durante la sesión plenaria, la falta de recursos financieros es uno de los principales obstáculos para las candidatas, para entrar en la política y para las campañas. Y se necesita dinero para esto, para llegar a los votantes. El financiamiento de campañas y la legislación puede mejorar la situación de las mujeres. Lo que Helen recién presentó, voy a enfocarme en cómo usar el financiamiento público como herramienta para mejorar la participación de las mujeres y la igualdad de género. Les voy a tratar de dar ejemplos concretos acerca de cómo usar el financiamiento público para mejorar las cuotas de, de género. Voy a mencionar las diferentes maneras de sanciones financieras o incentivos financieros para mejorar la participación de las mujeres. Lo que voy a hacer es dar tres ejemplos en tres países para identificar, identificar qué ha funcionado y tratar de proporcionar cuando puedo soluciones y especialmente tal vez innovadoras. Mi país es Romania. La ley dice que va a haber más financiamiento a los partidos en proporción a los el número de mujeres electas al Parlamento. En el papel parece ser una ley muy buena, pero cuando ven los números es completamente diferente. Vean el informe de las elecciones parlamentarias de 2012. En el Senado solo hay 7% mujeres. Y en la Cámara de Diputados, 20% mujeres. ¿Cuál es la causa? Una de las causas tal vez sea que en la ley electoral la cantidad de financiamiento adicional público no se menciona esto, ni una cuota. Así que, ¿cuál sería? Tenía que ser un incentivo, pero se sienten obligados a tener candidatos mujeres. Bueno, mi segundo país, Francia, mi país favorito. Como Ellen mencionó, creo que somos uno de los primeros países que han adoptado disposiciones de género. 
desde el inicio de este sistema de financiamiento público, es interesante ver que prefieren pagar las multas y no postular a mujeres. Les voy a dar una cifra muy interesante. Desde 2002, los partidos políticos han pagado casi 100 millones de dólares en multas. Eso significa que no tiene que ver con las medidas legislativas, tiene que ver con el comportamiento y la voluntad política. Y esto hay que considerar. Francia es Francia. Es una, un sistema patriarcal y los partidos resisten la idea de igualdad de género. Y cuando los partidos endosan a las candidatas es en lugares donde piensan que pueden ganar. El primer caso es muy interesante porque medidas legislativas muy buenas no tienen impacto cuando los principales interesados no tienen la voluntad para implementarlos. Así que, ¿cuál sería la solución para Francia? Primero, mejores sanciones. Eso significa que los partidos se les va a empujar, presionar, van a tener que cumplir. No sé si esto es una solución buena para Francia. La segunda que se podría proponer es reforzar criterio de género para financiamiento público y no se va a vincular ya a el número de candidatas, sino a las mujeres electas en el Parlamento. Y eso sí tendría efecto en Francia. La tercera perspectiva, y bueno, creo que es innovadora y para, para Francia y otros países, sería impulsar a, las, a los partidos para tener reglas internas para promover a las mujeres. La parte difícil de esta recomendación es un intento de legislar, es que se podría percibir como meterse a los asuntos del partido. Y bueno, el tercer país es Túnez. Y aquí en el público está un miembro del comité electoral, me lo explicó bien ayer. En Túnez hay una disposición en la ley que exige paridad vertical. Eso es bueno, significa que los candidatos alternan entre hombres y mujeres en la lista, pero no hay paridad horizontal. Si ven los números en 2014, solo 12% de la lista eran de mujeres. También se vinculó con lo, el número de circunscripciones y el número de listas. Y normalmente solo el primero en la lista llega al Parlamento. 